Pleasure to welcome to the stage distinguished Congresswoman from California, Democrat Leader Nancy Pelosi. Well, another little-known speaker. The, uh, um, when you look at Senator Harkin, you say, how, uh, how could we ever top that? Well, I'm going to introduce to you one well, of the most remarkable people to serve in the United States Congress in the history of this country. If, <clears throat> if, we, look, if we look back just on the recent history, if we look back on things that protected this country, that shaped it, that increased our values, that reinforced our values. Nancy Pelosi led the fight on the American uh, uh, Recovery Act. It was Nancy Pelosi's leadership that got that through. Without, without Nancy Pelosi, there wouldn't be an Affordable Care Act. Without Nancy Pelosi. Without Nancy Pelosi, Wall Street reforms would, after the crash in 2008 would have never occurred, but Nancy Pelosi got that through. Without Nancy Pelosi, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act would not be law. Food, nutrition, child safety, all because of Nancy Pelosi. American Clean Energy Act and, two, and Security Act. 2009 because of Nancy Pelosi. Tom Harkin's leading the fight for increase in minimum wage on the Senate side. Nancy Pelosi is leading the fight to raise the minimum wage on the House side. A new, a new GI Bill, the list could go on and on, but let me say to you, as the most important, the highest ranking woman uh, legislator in American history, Nancy Pelosi is, I've, I've unfortunately been around since Tip O'Neill. Nancy Pelosi is the most effective, compassionate, and I think uh, greatest leader uh, that I've ever worked with. And it's a pleasure to introduce to you a remarkable, remarkable individual. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Leader Nancy Pelosi. I was trying, and I tried. I do. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Well, listening to Tom Harkin, it makes you, pr if I may be allowed a partisan moment, makes you proud to be a Democrat. <laughs> but it also makes you proud to be an American, because those are the values of our country. Thank you, thank you, David, for your very generous remarks, as always, giving me more credit. The credit really goes to my House Democratic Caucus, who had these priorities, where we built the consensus to get the job done and to have Barack Obama in the White House uh, to not only inspire and lead, but to sign the legislation. So I thank you for recognizing the role of House Democrats in all of this. As usual, it is just a a delight to be with all of you because you are an inspiration to the rest of us. Not just because your enthusiasm at this breakfast, but because of the strength that each and every one of you brings from your communities. The commitment you have, uh, the compassion you have, the effectiveness uh, that you have. So I salute the National uh, Community Action Forum and want to dwell on that word community for a moment. How important it has always been to our country how valuing it has always improved our policy decision, policy making decisions, and how important that our sense of community has been to recognizing our responsibilities to each other. In my caucus, we remind each other that the word community has the word unity in it. And that's very important 
especially if you want to make legislative change, is to find the consensus, understand the need, the urgency, find the best public policy solutions, pass laws that improve the lives of the American people. And that should all center around America, about uh, us being the land of opportunity, and opportunity meaning what? Education, opportunity for jobs, the list goes on. Freedom, freedom to be who we are, of course, but freedom that the Affordable Care ha Act gives people to have life, a healthier life, liberty, that found this life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, that freedom to be, uh, if they wish to be a photographer, a camera, an artist, if they wish to start a business, change jobs, the portability of it all, and it gives people freedom. There are many other, uh, the ending discrimination, don't ask, don't tell, that repeal, advancing Lilly Ledbetter, all ending discrimination, increasing freedom. And it all has to be come with a sense of justice, a sense of justice. Uh, the pr president visited with the Pope this morning, and, and well, I don't know time-wise, but within the past several hours, at the Vatican, and as watching it with great emotion, I was recalling that Pope Benedict in his first encyclical, God is Love, he quoted St. Augustine. And St. Augustine said, now 17 centuries ago, St. Augustine said, any government that does not work for justice, to promote justice, is just a bunch of thieves. St. Augustine, St. Augustine. And, and Benedict went on to say, uh, and, uh, and it's hard to define justice, but you must not be blinded by special interests. Imagine, imagine. So just because the Pope is, the President is visiting there, I come to you a full of, of what our moral basis is for some of us and all of us have our, our um, a sense of responsibility to the future. But listening to Tom Harkin talk about LBJ and consistent with the moral basis for what we do, when Lyndon Johnson was doing all of that and he, ad and he addressed the needs of uh, people living in poverty, he referred to them as people on the outskirts of hope. On the outskirts of hope. Well, that's just can't be possible. And, and he acted uh, to, uh, to change that. But hope is, where is hope? People say, wh wh what reason do I have to have hope? Hope is where it always has been. It is sitting right there squarely between faith and charity and love. Faith, hope, charity. So people who have faith, faith in the future, faith in our country, faith in each other, a religious faith or not, but a faith in our responsibility, give people hope that in a, the charity, the love that is a sense of decency about our responsibilities to each other is reflected in our public policy. I was recently in Houston for some activities and went to church with my grandchildren who lived there and my fa their parents. And from the pulpit, the priest said, it's not enough to come here and pray on Sunday if you leave here and pray on other people for the rest of the week. So that is part, that is the part of the challenge that we face. All of the statements of nobility and decency, fairness, opportunity, freedom, and justice has to be matched or else, again, it's just words. So let's talk about some of this. I understand you're going to have a debate, a discussion <laughs> of the budget in the next couple of weeks. Senator Harkin rightly focused on that. When he talked about the, uh, the, the um, farm bill coming to the floor, $40 billion cut in, in uh, food stamps, they thought that was an okay number because in the budget, the Republican budget, the cut was $140 billion. So $40 billion, what's your problem? It's a big problem. So again, it's all of this. The, 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 I guess the best story I can tell you about the challenge we face in terms of ostensible statements of, of charity and faith and the rest and the disconnect between that and the policy on Capitol Hill is when, and, and again, I'm referencing 
what Tom Harkin said about if you work hard, play by the rules, you make the minimum wage, you should be able uh, to feed your family. Or if you lose your job through no fault of your own, you should be able to have that safety net. And by the way, that safety net is not for individuals. Individuals are part of an economic system that requires that as we go in cycles when unemployment is high, that everybody benefits for this from the safety net, including businesses and corporate America. It's in their interest. But nonetheless, you see the fight. Really, it's an indecency. It's an immorality that we don't have that. But just to get back to the point that Senator Harkin made. So when he said that, it was reminded that that's what the president said in the State of the Union address. If you work hard and work full time, you should be able to uh, not have to raise your child in poverty. So after the speech, I went up to some of the Republicans and I said, you know, you guys really look bad. When the president says that, that's a shared value in our country. At least you could pretend you were applauding. You know, maybe no sound. We do that all the time, no sound applause, right? <laughs> on certain occasions. You could just, uh, but to sit on your hands, and the American people are watching you on TV. What is it that you can't identify? You work hard, you work full time, you make the minimum wage, you should be able to feed your family. And then the other one. Our, and something I'll talk about a little more in a moment. When women succeed, America succeeds. Our initiative. <laughs> See? So it's a, it's a and it's applause line. It's the title of our economic agenda for women and families, but it's also a statement of fact. When women succeed, America succeeds. So do you think a little of this because you're just sitting there on your hands? And this is what I was told. And this is what I want to tell you. I was told that in order to understand why th that caucus acts the way they do, is because those people that we're talking about, minimum wage, unemployment insurance, food stamps, those people are indifferent. Those people are invisible. Those people are invisible to, the, to that caucus. And therefore, that caucus is indifferent to their needs. Invisible and indifferent. Is that a stunning statement? But it explains why we have to have a discharge petition on raising the minimum wage, why we have to have a discharge petition on unemployment insurance, why we have to have a discharge petition on immigration reform because of the indifference. That reminded me, again, to a religious theme, of the parable of the Good Samaritan, our responsibility to strangers, not just to each other, but to strangers. Now remember that parable. Some, this person is beaten up, left by the road. The people from his own community came down the street, the road, crossed the road to go to the other side, invisible, indifferent, until the Good Samaritan came, offered help, and the rest of that. So therein lies the difference. To respect the dignity and worth of every person, the spark of divinity that lives in every person, including ourselves, and the responsibility that that carries. So when we come to Washington and have to make these decisions, what is the respect that we have for the sense of community that is our responsibility. We have, um, so this budget fight, this is really going to be the appropriate debate as to who recognizes community, who recognizes the strength of our country is not just in our military might, as important as that is, but in the health, the education, and the well-being of the American people. And the difference between one budget and the other, as terms of their path to the future, is very drastic, very drastic. And we believe that a, sp budget, a federal budget should be a statement of our values, that what we care about as a country, what is important to us, is reflected in those budget allocations of resources. So it'll, it's going to be a very interesting couple of weeks, couple of months, and in, in a couple of minutes uh, for all of you to hear that contrast. But again, again, it, we cannot mis, uh, uh, under, mis, 
people cannot misrepresent their values on the one hand and not have them translated into respect for people on the other. Now, let me just tell you that how we th would like to see some of this happen, like to see reflected in the budget, and that is when women succeed, America succeeds. Been all over the country listening to women as to what would make the biggest difference in their workplace life, their home work balance. Health, it's not about health care, violence against women, we've done that. Uh, at, 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 at Joe Biden was our champion on violence against women. Uh, and, and that bill only passed because we made it too hot to handle, and finally it had to be brought up on the floor 600 days after its authorization stopped. So there's some, you know, again, I say this because your role is so important. We can only do so much maneuvering inside. The outside mobilization is what makes real change. So what did we come down to? Pay. Pay equity. By April 7th or 8th is when women will, who make 77 cents on a dollar will be receiving pay. In other words, they've worked three for free for the first three months because they only make 77 cents on the dollar of somebody, a man of equal competence, experience, education, et cetera, equal qualifications. That's just not right. Do you want that for your sister, your mother, your daughter? <laughs> but also, and Rosa DeLauro has the bill, Pay Equity Act. We passed it in the House. You know, same old story. We passed it in the House. The 60-vote requirement prevented it becoming law in the Senate. Second, part of the pay uh, um, pillar, raise the minimum wage. Raise the minimum wage. Ha uh, George Miller is our champion in the House, and it's Hark and Miller doing this together. Over 60% of the people making the minimum wage are women. And they're not teenagers. They're not putting that to rest. These are average age 30-something. Second point, paid leave. How paid sick leave? How could it be in the greatest country that ever existed in the history of the world that if a mom gets sick or if her child gets sick or if her parent gets sick, she cannot take care of that child? They don't she doesn't have a day of sick leave. She can't not go to work, she'll be docked pay, and she cannot afford that. And if she gets docked a couple too many times, she won't have a job, and she has no child care. So we hear stories from bus drivers, school bus drivers telling us that they see it every day, moms with tears in their eyes putting a sick child on the bus because they have no alternative. It's not good for the child, it's not good for the other children, it's not good for our country paid sick leave, and we have legislation to do just that. And that's not just about women. That's about women and men and families and our responsibilities. And the third is, the, is what the president has in his budget uh, and has advocated for uh, early childhood learning in, term, in, for, in the form of, of um, uh, universal kindergarten, but that's only part of it. And it has to start much younger from birth the opportunity for parents to have their child in quality, affordable settings where they can learn. Children learning, parents earning. And what it does for the kids, I'll just tell you this one story from the road. A young woman got up there and she told us that she had over, she's a single mom from the immigrant community, five kids, what is she gonna do? And she got it all together and she, ha she now had a job because her kids were in, uh, had been in, um, uh, early uh, head start, and so now she she had a job and she got a promotion, and she was our guest to tell us her story of success. And she said, "You know what? I feel so confident. I have my children; they're in good shape. I have this job. I got a promotion. But I was very scared to come speak at Hunter College to all these women uh, about my story. So I asked my kids if I could rehearse my speech last night. She said last night." And uh, I gave my speech, and at the end I said, do you have any comments or any questions? And my four-year-old, who's in Head Start, raised her hand, and she said, I just have one question, Mom. Who gave you permission to use my name in your speech? <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine the confidence. Imagine the self-esteem. Imagine that wonderful difference that that early childhood education head start, giving that child a head start. You know all the statistics about how early we have to start educating our children. You also know 
that anybody who says we have to cut Pell Grants or early childhood education so that we can reduce the deficit, and that is stupid. One of the most stupid, <laughs> that's stupid. One of the most stupid, but there's such competition for that honor that I hesitate to say the most. Because, you know what? Nothing, and this is back to the budget, nothing brings more money to the Treasury than the education of the American people. Earliest childhood education, <laughs> K through 12, higher ed, <laughs> lifetime learning. So when they tell you it's more important to give $38 billion in tax incentives to big oil to drill, big oil who will make a trillion dollars in that same time frame, they don't need an incentive. And, you don't, uh, and it's better to cut $38 billion from Pell Grants than to cut that subsidy. You know that there is something wrong with the values debate that we are having. <laughs> so, in, in any event, for these and other reasons, we don't want these issues to be partisan. Over time, they have not the job creation of uh, investing in the building of our infrastructure, the education of our children for our competitiveness and our um, keeping America number one, for what it means in people's lives, for our families and the rest, and to recognize that our founders built this country on the idea that every generation would take responsibility to make the future better for the next, and that's why our country would always prevail. In our great seal of the United States, it says, novus order seclorum, a new order for the ages. They wrote that over 200 years ago. And that constant commitment to the future is reinforced by every immigrant who comes to our country with hopes, dreams, aspirations, optimism, determination, and courage to make the future better for their families. And so that constant reinvigoration is part of the American dream as well. So we have a clear path, in my view, that shouldn't even be considered partisan. In fact, there is bipartisan support in the country for raising the minimum wage, for giving the, uh, to extending the unemployment benefits, for passing immigration reform, all of those things, for early childhood education. The public is there. And we just make, have to make sure that the public policy decisions reflect what the American people who are so wise understand to be so. So I'm here to thank you because you have that word community in your name. It is such a powerful word. You know since the beginning of our country, that community, whether it was um, de Tocqueville or whomever, everybody knew that's what made America special, our responsibilities to each other. And that word unity in there to come to consensus about what our priorities are, if we agree, contrary to what uh, Augustine characterized as a bunch of thieves, if we agree that we are here, if we are here to promote justice. And I'll just close with this one thing, and I didn't say this last year, I don't think, but in studying all of these, the histories of societies that have succeeded, and just looking at uh, Toynbee's history of civilization, he says in his works that so societies can take a couple different paths. And there are those who are formed for creative, to be creative, creative consensus. He says it in other words, I'm abbreviating. And they are there to work for the common good, for the flowering of the society. And if that society goes down, it takes a turn to where it is a, 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 a government for special interest or starts out that way, for the few, the rich, the special interest, that creates a, chas a, a chasm, a, a schism in society. A schism, he says, in the soul of society, where you have these, this disparity of purpose of the government. And so we don't ever want to get to a place like that. We're hopeful people. We believe in the wisdom of the American people who are committed to a sense of community. But we have important work to do. We have important work to do. And I'm here to thank you. I called David Bradley. I think I called him an angel last year. Was that what I called him?
n not that I'm in that position to decide who's an angel, but I think he's an angel. <laughs> what, he's so great in how he works tirelessly, as well as members of your board from all over, and each and every one of you. Thank you for the work that you do to pull people from the outskirts of hope into the center of our purpose in our country, a country committed to freedom, to opportunity, and to justice, and to justice. So I, I'm very honored to be with you this morning to share some thoughts. You come at a perfect time when we are about to embark on the, um, uh, on the debate uh, on the budget. I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, Jim Costa, who worked so hard to fight those food stamp <laughs> cuts. And so hard, so hard. Uh, for these and other reasons, I, I, uh, I'm proud to be here with him. But since we've been, since, Har since um, Harry, <laughs> Mr. Leader, uh, uh, I talked to him about this very subject last night, and uh, Tom Harkin talked about it. I want you to know who our point person was on the committee. He and Marsha Fudge uh, uh, fought this fight for all of us. You, uh, to feed the hungry, I mean, it's a biblical charge. It's a biblical charge. Let's not just pray in church on Sunday. Let's do the Lord's work the rest of the week. Thank you all very much for the opportunity.